Welcome to Slate School and our panel discussion entitled Play in School and Society. Slate School is committed to excellence in education and we are delighted to present the Education Idea Lab, which is a new unique virtual series that is free and open to the public. This thought leading event convenes leaders, change makers and participants from all sectors of education and innovation. Thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to have all of you with us here today. My name is Julie Mountcastle and I am head of school at Slate School. I'll briefly introduce you to Slate School, review the webinar logistics, and we'll then hear from our five amazing panelists. So Slate School is an independent 501c3 nonprofit elementary school where education is focused on cultivating creativity, fostering ingenuity, and inspiring a deep passion for lifelong learning. At Slate School, we have formed a community that is constantly striving to improve practice, to create meaningful educational experiences for learners of all ages, and to change the landscape in education. Slate School convenes experts for important, authentic conversations about education, and these online dialogues, like today's, are free and open to the public. We are so delighted to have all of you with us today. I believe we have learners joining us from six continents. So now I'll describe the basic logistics of this webinar. We have five amazing panelists and they have a wealth of expertise to share with you during the next hour. And each of our panelists today will give about a two minute introduction about themselves and their current role and some of their key guidance and advice about play in school and society. We'll then proceed with the panel discussion. We invite you to submit additional questions as comments on, on Facebook, and we will select some of those questions uh, to ask the panelists today too. So we'll proceed with having our panelists introduce themselves in alphabetical order. I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panelist, uh, Jane Aronson. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, hi. Happy to be with everybody here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm in Maplewood, New Jersey. Uh, and two minutes, I'm looking at my timing. Okay, on <laughs> my, go. Uh, I am uh, actually a clinical assistant professor of pediatrics at Cornell Weill Medicine. And, uh, and I am an HIV AIDS expert uh, from, a, from the domestic pandemic that occurred in the 80s. And, um, and in three countries abroad. And I am um, also a, um, a, in a quirky way, uh, um, still doing adoption medicine, however uh, crazy that sounds considering the, the, the global pandemic. There are a lot of people who are still interested in creating families through adoption domestically as, as well as internationally. And, but mostly more important than anything else, I'm really, I've become the student who I have always wanted to be and, who, and, and have been all my life. What does that mean is that the opportunity that we have all been offered now to learn about something we know nothing about. Once again, just like AIDS, we knew nothing. And we knew nothing for a long time and we still were extremely smart to figure things out and to help people and to save lives. And here we are again, and I'm having an opportunity to be a student, to learn everything I can suck up and, uh, and uh, absorb and to then share with people, you know, the conundrums and the puzzles around it. And frankly, uh, this fits my time of life at 68 years of age. I just couldn't be more interested in learning and especially about children uh, who I adore and love to bits and who I think that we have a, a, um, we have a fierce and um, um, warrior-like approach at this point in time to making sure that the kids can benefit from this pandemic and that we can help them be the, the best humans that they can be on this planet. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Jane. And now I'd like to introduce you to Jesse Robert Cofino. Jesse. Julie, thank you so much, Dr. Aronson, um, uh, Roberta, Jana, Dr. Gray, Dr. Gal Galenkoff. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all today. Um, for the last five years, I've worked very closely um, with an educator in Anji County, China, who has oh. created um, an approach, a, a philosophy, um, a set of physical materials and very um, 
sophisticated teacher practices that focus foremost on guaranteeing the child's right to play. Um, but that first begins with the child's right to love, and which, which really is safety. Um, and what we get from starting with safety, starting with um, trust in the child, um, space and time for the child to express themselves and to be heard, um, to have their stories listened to first before we tell stories about their experience, that when you create that safety, when you create those clear, consistent environments um, that are open-ended and minimally structured, um, when you're responding and listening to the needs of children, that the natural trajectory of children is to understand the world and themselves and people around them, um, to make connections. I think a lot of cognitive science is telling us that children are engaged in a process of cause and effect mapping, seeing the relationships between their efficacy and the world around them, whether it's the physical world or the social world. And so that natural trajectory of children's experience in a safe environment, I guess we could call it play. We advocate for a simple definition of play as deep and uninterrupted engagement in the activity of one's own choice. And so when that happens, you see risk, which could be physical risk, but it's really fundamentally the risk of making a prediction based on information. The more safety we have, the more we can confront uncertainty because uncertainty is models and predictions and science. It's, you know, does, do we have antibodies? Do they do something for us in this situation? Do these tests work? When will school open? There's a lot of uncertainty in children's lives and our adult lives now. And so we have to be clear about the things that are certain about the role of safety, the role of listening. Um, and that just leads to these beautiful expressions of discovery in children. As adults, we can discover children engaged in that discovery. Um, and that text, which is the child, which is their experience, should form the basis of our knowledge of any given child. And the decisions we make as adults in creating the conditions for children's learning and in creating the space for children to be heard. And that's the message we take from Anji. That's also the work we do with our pilot programs in the United States and Head Start and Early Head Start programs, the works that we're doing in, in, in Africa and in Europe, it comes back to a clear definition of safety, protecting that right, and letting people discover and see children. Because administrators see that, policymakers see that, adults see that, and they see how their needs for children are being addressed through the child's natural trajectories. Um, and each child is different, and each child has needs and, and circumstances that vary, but each child needs to be listened to, each child needs to be seen, each child needs to be believed in, that they have the capacity to meet their own needs when they can and you know, express their ability to solve problems that they confront in those social and physical worlds. Jesse, I love your passion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Um, and now uh, Roberta, and I'm gonna say this, Michnik Golinkoff. Excellent. Roberta. I did it? Excellent. Awesome. So I'm here in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware. I am honored to be included with this wonderful group, especially Peter Gray, who has been writing on these issues for a long time and has been a leader in our field. So first of all, play is universal. Animals play, octopus play. Have you guys seen the a video of the crow that brings a piece of cardboard up to the top of a sloped roof, places it at the top, jumps on it, and then sleds down? Yeah. Birds. <laughs> we knew the Corvid family was smart, but playing, making a sled, I mean, that's <laughs> fantastic, right? So not only is play universal and across species, it's at the root of our democracy is how I feel. I feel like play is more important than ever in the face of um, some totalitarian tendencies in our current administration. I would love to see parents and children playing more together at home now that they are at home, given that parents are children's first teachers, and I don't mean that parents have to teach children in an explicit way. When parents play with their children, 
in the most natural and organic way and let the children take the lead, children are exposed to things that make a difference in children's lives. For example, playing blocks together. If the parent follows the kid's lead and uses terms like on top of, over, under, through, that is spatial language that just comes naturally out of grown-ups, and that we know makes a difference for children's learning of spatial and mathematical concepts. So it's really important to encourage this kind of play between parents and children. Now, I know that there is a lot of stress out there now, and that I feel like we are among the privilege. There are many families who don't know where their next meal is coming from and who are worried about whether they can <coughs> continue to live in the space they're in because they may not be able to make the rent. Mm -hmm. I would urge even those parents who are perhaps not so much listening to this broadcast that play is good for them too. That 10 minutes of play sitting on the floor with your child if you focus on what the child is doing and just start out by describing what the child is doing, your own stress level will decline. Same thing with reading to children. It will reduce your own stress level. So I'm all for play. I'm also a researcher who tries to discover what the parameters and limits are for different kinds of play. And I'm sure that we will get into that when we have our conversation. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much, Roberta. I think, I think there's already a theme emerging. Um, and now uh, to introduce everyone to Peter Gray. Peter, welcome. Thank you for coming. I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I'm a research professor at Boston College. I retired from teaching a long time ago, but I continue to conduct research and do a lot of writing. I have uh, for many years been focused on play, how children learn through play, <coughs> how they learn through play and their self-directed exploration. Um, you know, the idea that children learn by being taught is a pretty new idea from an evolutionary point of view. Throughout human history, children taught themselves and they did so through play and exploration. And unfortunately, in recent times, we're suppressing that. We're suppressing it in our schools, we're suppressing it out of schools. One of the uh, things that I've documented, not so much from my own research, but by bringing other people's research together, is that over the last six decades, there has been a continuous and overall huge decline in children's opportunities to play. And uh, to play, as, uh, as Jesse said, a, a key part of the definition of play is it's self-chosen, self-directed. It's what children choose to do. We have altered childhood. We have, I would argue, suppressed childhood. We have almost destroyed childhood in our modern time. Children are meant to play with other children, away from adults. Children, this is what children, this is how children learn to be adults. This is how children learn to solve their own problems. It's how they learn to negotiate with their peers without some authority figure doing it for them. This is how children learn to take initiative and so on. This is also how children acquire the emotional skills to deal with the bumps in the road of life because they experience them and so on and so forth. The other thing that has been documented and I have, uh, I have brought some, the, the documentation together in my writings is that over this same period that there's been this huge decline in children's freedom just to go out and play, there mm -hmm. has been an equally huge increase in all sorts of mental disorders of childhood. And it's not just that we're identifying disorders that we didn't identify before. These are by standard questionnaires, like the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory that has a scale for depression. Based on that, the rate of depression among school-age children, this would be mostly teenagers because they're the ones who have been tested, uh, by this measure, the, the rate of, of depression uh, by the year 2000 was somewhere between five and eight times what it was in the 1950s. And this has been a gradual increase and depression has increased since then. 
the rate of childhood suicide is now six times what it was in the 1950s. And in my writing, I've argued for a cause-effect relationship, as if one would have to argue for a cause-effect relationship. You take away for play from children and they're going to be depressed, right? <laughs> So that's uh, some of my writing. I've also, I've also studied how children who are free to play and explore and freed from the kinds of compulsions of, um, of what we call schooling, educate themselves through their play and self-directed education when they have the opportunities to do so. So that's uh, just a little bit of background on um, some of my research of writing. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you. So excited to hear more. Um, and now friends, just to introduce you to Jana Zendel. Welcome Jana, so glad you could come. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. I, I always go last, my last name. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I should think about that actually and go in yeah, reverse yeah. order sometimes. That's, you know, that's what I do in the classroom, right? Start in the middle. Right. Well, uh, I also, I feel very honored to be on uh, this call with all of you. Um, all of you have inspired my own journey in different ways. And I, I've met with all of you, I've read your work. And uh, so thank you, Julie, for, for inviting me to be here. Uh, as you said, I'm Jana Zendel. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Ubuntu Pathways. I've been with Ubuntu for almost 20 years. We just turned 20 last year. And I spent the majority of those years in South Africa where our organization is in the townships. Uh, of Port Elizabeth. And what we do is we have cradle to career support for, for children and their families in, in this vulnerable community that we work in. And um, over the past 20 years, we've built a community health clinic that provides women and children with pre and postnatal care. We provide HIV treatment to over 400 individuals in our community. We have primary health care services. We have counseling, support, and outreach programs. Uh, about 10 years ago, we launched our early childhood program. And when I joined Ubuntu uh, almost 20 years ago, which dates me, my dream uh, when I first was down in South Africa was that Ubuntu would open up a school to break the mold of the traditional education that I was seeing in all of the schools that I visited. And it took us 20 years. And we finally opened our Ubuntu school, which helps us complete the pathway for our children and our community out of poverty. So I'm very excited about that. And, um, you know, as far as, Every, everybody's kind of said it all already, and there's so much that we can elaborate on on all of this. But I just kind of, I want to follow up on, on Roberta's point and uh, Dr. Gray's point regarding just this, what's happening right now and the freedom to play that is an opportunity right now, this free, this freedom from school, right? Nobody's in school, so we're home. And I've got two little boys that are not here right now, which is pretty crazy, but they're running around and they're playing and they're free. And I, I see it. I see all the challenges that exist and I feel very privileged to be in the environment that I'm in right now. But for children everywhere, I see this opportunity for us to take back to, to re embrace play. And what I've seen is that it's, you know, children play wherever they are. Children play unless they're stopped from playing. It's the adults that we really have to worry about. It's the adults that tend to over-regulate play. And right now we can see it more than ever. We're, we're working, we're under stress, we're trying to work from home, we need order. And when we see play happening, there's this fear that play could disrupt the peace of, of the learning environment, the home or the school. So we create these rules and we set these parameters and Right now, there's so much focus on what we need to do for our children in, in this remote learning environment and how do we bring in the academics and what, what, do our, what are the metrics and what goals should our children be achieving by the end of April and May. And I think what we need to do more than anything is make sure that parents understand that it's okay for their children to play and create the home environment to be a place to explore and investigate and fuel their curiosity. And for myself, Roberta, you mentioned, you know, play, we need to play as adults and reading, even reading with our children and playing with them de-stresses us. And in this environment that we're in right now, the only thing that is keeping me grounded is when I'm playing with my kids and I'm reading with them. And where I work in, in the townships, you know, you had mentioned this, the spaces that different people are in, the spaces, people are living in shacks and one room, homes with 
10 or more people living in them. And yes, they're thinking about food and not about all the protocols for social distancing and everything that we're talking about. But what we're encouraging and what we're seeing in the homes that we work in is that parents are playing with their children and that's what's helping to de-stress them too. So I'm excited about that opportunity in this new environment that we're, we're all facing right now. Yeah, Jenna, I think, um... I, I had a I had a colleague and her, her name was Ann her name was Ann Kyler and um, she used to always say no matter what situation you're in uh, you can be at home you can be at work I was a new parent and you know in my job there as a teacher and she just said listen if if things start going sideways just step back and watch the child because the children will tell you and I think for so long. Um, over time, we've, we've started to think that we know better. And it's really just not, it's just not true. Um, there are so many, so many greater lessons I've, I've learned actually from children. And maybe actually I should convene a, a, a meeting like this where kids tell us exactly what we're, what we're doing wrong in the world, because I think they probably have, they probably have the right idea about that. And, and I just haven't listened well enough to pick it up. Um, I just wanted to, I, I was to, to say to Jane, because I, I, I think I've had a conversation with you about this before, about, about how um, you kind of define play across ages. And, and just kind of, if you could talk a little bit about what, um, what some of the misconceptions are in our world about play. Um, I think it's, it, I have to sneak in and say, it's really interesting how I introduced myself today. Um, <laughs> some of the people who know me well would say, it's kind of interesting Freudian uh, uh, operations here because I'm, you know, uh, I ran a foundation for 23 years, which I founded in 1997, and um, I didn't include it in our opening discussion, uh, but um, I just wanted to sort of uh, bring that up, because obviously that has bearing on something that I'm going to say about play, okay? And that is that sometimes we just don't know what play is. We know what it is, because we're academics and we've spent so much of our careers uh, writing, researching, exper and experiencing play. So let me just say to you, I, I want to plant the seed here that like much of what's going on in our society today, we don't uh, necessarily define uh, lots of what goes on for children. What's education for children? What does learning mean? What does play mean? We, we forget the definition and what's lovely today between the hours of 11 and 12, we're going to be able to do that. Um, and how lucky are we? But let me say to you that I feel very strongly about this is that I had an incredible life of play. And I want to really mark that as, as how to answer your question about defining play. I'm still playing and had this incredibly lovely upbringing where I lived on the top of my father's store and played in a neighborhood which bordered on Jamaica and St. Albans, which was all black. My father uh, was a grocery store owner and I played with the children in the neighborhood and, 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 and just humorously, I'll bring up the fact that I, I did not know that they were black. I, I, I would see their hands and they would, we would play ball together and I would see that the palms of, of their hands were white. And I would think to myself, how come someone says that that person's a Negro? And I was a little girl. I was born in Brooklyn, raised there for the first four years of my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I was very engaged in a kind of culture, if you will, of play play on the street. And then when we moved to Long Island, um, I was constantly at play. School was play in many ways for me, but I was very engaged in being uh, gardening and playing, excuse me, playing war with my little soldiers in my giant bag of thousands of pieces of shoulders. And, 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 and all of that play, sport and play and dance and music, it was a major part of my life as were cartoons, which actually were powerful ways to stimulate my understanding of play. Loved uh, uh, Chuck Jones, devoted to the concept of what was seen in the cartoon, uh, even though obviously cartoons are quite antiquated in many ways from that day. But, but my life was about play and I never stopped feeling the importance of the connections that were made in the neighborhood all of the stuff we did together, the making of rules that were arbitrary, the freedom to be bad, the freedom to be good, the freedom to learn, the freedom to, to create. 
projects. We were building all the time. We were drawing. And so that's never left my life and has always been the, the saving grace for how I see play in children's lives and how important I felt it was as a pediatrician in em emphasizing to parents this final piece of my little uh, presentation. And that is, I felt very early on that adults were dangerous. <laughs> And not only because my parents and my family was fairly neurotic, but basically because they, they would make rules about when we had to, had to get in at the end of the day. And how, how more important it was that we get in before it was dark, which was ridiculous. It was best to play when it got dark, actually, you had an advantage. But the, the fun piece here is the, the, they stuck, they were stuck. Our families were stuck about content in education that if we played too much, if we had too much recreation, too much time on the tarmac, <laughs> we weren't gonna be good students and we weren't gonna be able to achieve in school and go to college. And so play and learning were at odds yeah. when we were growing up. Yeah. Can, can I jump in on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so uh, Jane, we have reached the point now that the American Academy of Pediatrics in their journal, Pediatrics, put out an article I was one of the co-authors on that offered pediatricians the idea of giving families a prescription for play. Yeah. I how, how low have we gone when we have to inform pediatricians that they need to tell their families that it's okay to play by issuing a prescription. There's just not enough free play going on. And a lot of it has to do with fear. Now, if you live in a neighborhood that has a lot of crime, okay, it's a different issue. I understand why you can't let your children go out, but they could play in the house. And for those children who can get out, that's how children learn to be autonomous and independent. Little by little, they wander further and further away from where they live. And I can remember too, this is uh, gonna be about Brooklyn, uh, the thrill of being able to walk to the library by myself to get books. You know, that feeling of independence and becoming more adult-like is what we deny our children when we don't let them spend time alone with peers in play. And you know, there's a, Maurice Sendak has a book, The Sign on Rosie's Door. Yeah. And there's a scene when Rosie turns to her, her mom says to Rosie, go do something. And she goes and she writes a note on the door. She comes back and the mom says, what did you do? And she says, well, I wrote a sign on the door. Her mom says, go do something else. And the implication is she should just go and do what she needs to do. I mean, that was, that was Brooklyn. Um, that was this idea that you know, there is a division between the child space, as Peter is saying, that space of freedom separate from the adult's needs um, that they have. Um, I think though, you know, Jane, you said your life was about play, but, you know, I think that if we think of play as deeply engaged, self-directed activity, one of the reasons Julia saying I'm so passionate is this is play for me. Um, you know, I'm joyously, deeply engaged in this conversation and, and hearing you also. I hope that play for adults is not simply playing with children, but also having children see adults play. Um, that's really important. Um, because if you want to model for children, model deep and uninterrupted joyous engagements, like if you have the conditions to do that, because we do have so much on us right now. Um, but I think that with Peter's question, you know, teaching has, has not long been a part of the child's experience. What worries me now is if we look at guided play, learning through play, that teaching is now becoming part of play. Where, as Peter says, like the, the needs of the adults and the children have to be somewhat separate um, for a child to have that experience. What we're looking at is how can an adult be present and see that and witness that and record that and then listen to children talk about that. Um, they might not need to know that they're Julie, learning. Julie, <laughs> they are learning. Julie, I'm making notes, but could you make a note that we should discuss gender and play, okay? Okay. All right, I'll, I'll make a note. We'll, we'll get there. Peter, I, I, I want to ask you, now, I, it seems so clear. It, it, you know, we're all sitting here, you know, the, the six of us nodding our heads like crazy, and I know that we're not alone in the world. How have we gone so far astray 
and um, what are we doing wrong that we're not getting this message to people in a way that they can hear it and, and be relieved that they don't have to do so much, um, you know, massaging of what kids are doing. I guess I'm going to interpret that question as what are we doing wrong as a society that has led us to think that kindergarten children should be being drilled in reading and numbers <laughs> instead of playing. Yes. What? Yes. Why have I have uh, you know the the uh, the neighboring town of uh, Brookline is. Uh, to me, uh, the kindergarten teachers have almost all threatened to resign because they are being forced to do what they regard as cruel to children, which is to not have play in kindergarten and to be teaching academic stuff. We have gone insane as a society, absolutely insane, in the sense of focusing on this so-called academics. What does academics even mean to a kindergarten child? <laughs> My goodness, I mean, children, what every, every developmental psychologist knows, every, everybody who understands children know that children learn by playing and exploring. They have to figure out the world. They don't learn by being drilled and tested and taught in this kind of way. And it's, it's just, it, we, the problem is, the real problem, it, it comes from a number of things. It is true that the fears we have of society, the, the fears that have developed in society are a big part of it. We're irrationally afraid. We think that there are dangers out there that we've exaggerated the dangers, partly from the media, partly because experts tend to play them up and so on and so forth. And we've lost our common sense about this. But the weight of school, is driving a lot of this, the weight of school. School has over time become a bigger and bigger thing. It's taking more of children's time. When I was in school in the 1950s, we had five extra weeks of vacation compared to today. The school day was shorter. We had in elementary school two hours outdoors, a half hour recess in the morning, half hour in the afternoon, a full hour at lunch. Somehow we've developed the absurd notion that children are better off sitting in their seats <laughs> doing <Yeah>. boring work <laughs> instead of playing and exploring, which they're designed to do, which is how they develop their brains and intellect. And, and what we're doing instead is drilling for tasks that are, don't really have much to do with the realities of life. They're not really very important things to learn, <laughs> but somehow we've made that the measure of education. We've gotten under this kick that somehow you can measure education with standardized tests. And so the goal of school is to increase those tests. And the belief is that you increase those test scores by drilling children, preventing them from play. That's the biggest problem. That's the driving problem. And then parents have bought into this. So we've come away with the idea that child, you know, what I sometimes call the schoolish view of child development, that children develop best when they're carefully guided and directed by adults. Children develop by, take, by seizing the opportunities for independence, by learning to become adults, by, by, by solving their own problems by getting lost and finding their way home, by getting in trouble and finding their way out of trouble, by being bullied and figuring out how to deal with the bully without some adult there solving all their problems for them. But we have developed this idea that, that it's our job as adults always to be around children, always to solve their problems for them, always to tell them what to do because we know better than they do. And the result is we're not giving them the opportunity to learn how to solve their own problems. So I think that's the big problem. And, and part of it is, you know, it, until recently, there was no, and by recently, I mean the, mo the last few decades, <laughs> there was no particular reason to really be talking about the value of play. Everybody just assumed this is what kids do. <laughs> they play, <laughs> you know, they play. And, you know, that's what kids do. It's like if you're a fish, you don't worry about water. You your water's there, right? But as soon as the water's missing, then you have fish writing dissertations about the importance of water. And got us this into is trouble, Peter. This is, this is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of, so the other, the other thing I want to say, so we're a bunch of adults talking about play. 
And so we're kind of talking about the role of adults and we're talking about adult play and so on and so forth. That's natural, we're adults. There was a study done uh, a number of years ago where uh, kids, they wanted to know how kindergarten kids define play. So they showed kids uh, various pictures and asked them, is this play or not play? The determining factor as to whether they decided it was play or not play, was there an adult in the picture? If there was an adult in the picture, it was not play. <laughs> they assumed that that adult was directing the activity, that that adult would be interfering, that that adult would be, to kids, play is what you do with other kids, without yeah. adults, or you do it yourself. And so the idea that we should play with kids, that's fine. We should play with kids. It's good for us. <laughs> it's good for the kids if they're playing with other kids. It's not bad for the kids to play with us as long as we're really playing and not using it to be teaching them something or not using it, you know, the, the uh, I, I actually once Googled, should we playing with children? And I found all these moms who said, I'm told I'm supposed to play with my child. And so I play with my child. Let me be honest, I hate playing with my child. <laughs> I, found, I found mom saying this. And, and then when I read on why they were saying this, I realized it's because they had this notion that playing with your child means letting your child take control and letting your child dictate to you what you are supposed to do. And so they would say things like, you know, my child wants to play this game that involves twirling a hoop around and around. And, and I have to admit it was fun for the first hundred times <laughs> and then it got pretty boring. Or my child wants to play a fantasy game, a make-believe game, and she tells me exactly what character I have to be and what words I have to say. And she doesn't allow me the freedom to do what I want to do. And so my response to those parents is no self-respecting child would allow themselves to be bullied by your daughter in that way. <laughs> you know? And so you're not helping your daughter by playing in that way. So it's, it's hard for parents to play with adults because we're very different. We're, adults are very, I mean, hard for adults to play with kids because we're different from the kids. We, have, we're, we're, we don't have the same energy level, we don't have the same humor, we don't have the same tolerance for repetition. And also we tend to think that our job when we're playing is to somehow help our children instead of just to have fun. And if you're not just having fun, it's not play. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that is and that is that is sometimes hard for us to just just do, just yeah. just to be there in the moment. I, I think our primary role with regarding play as adults is to be sure that our children have have other children to play with. That's what children need, and we are we now live in a society where our children are deprived of that. They see other children in school, but they don't have the opportunity to play in school. And we're depriving them of other opportunities. And when we, they do see other children, it's in some kind of adult-directed sports or some kind of adult-directed things instead of just going out to play. <laughs> Mucking around. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, go ahead, Jenna. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, you touched on so many things that I want to add on to. But, and I know this is not a conversation about policy, educational policy. But I do want to follow up on, on your first point about what's happening in school right now and kindergartners being forced to learn how to read and, and all of that. And, you know, we all know it's got to be this whole shift in the system and perception. But what I see also now we're talking, I see Brooklyn as this common thread. I'm a parent of two little boys in Brooklyn. And what I see is that the schools that allow you to you know, not be forced into this system where children need to, you know, focus on all these academics in kindergarten are schools that are not affordable to most families. So if you go to the public schools, my, and my children go to a great public school, this isn't about, you know, public versus private, but the reality is that, you know, the testing, the standardized testing you're talking about, all that that's happening right now, and you know we can talk about all the schools that we're connected to in our own lives personally and professionally that to me is one of is a huge barrier in any community that we're talking about and that is what we're trying to do at ubuntu is provide a different type of learning to children in an environment where they don't have that type of just the experience to play and 
you have that time. But I, I don't really have anything else to say about it. But to me, I just sit on that. And I, it's such a challenge because you're trying to shift perceptions, but if that's reinforced to parents over and over again in communities, then you know what's important becomes that, what those metrics look like. Maybe I can respond to that with something that, so I'm a member of the, uh, one of the founding board members of an organization called Let Grow. Lenore Skenazy is the president of it. And we've been working with schools and whole communities to bring play into children's lives. And so, there, there are a growing number of schools that have bought into this, mostly elementary schools. So for just for example, one, there's a school district on Long Island, the Patchog Medford School District, where they have the, uh, unfortunately he's moved, unfortunately for Patchog Medford, the superintendent has moved to a, a bigger district. Um, he's become somewhat famous from what he's done in his, in his district. But he decided that he, he came to the conclusion that what the schools that he was superintendent of were doing was harmful to children. And he, be, he made a lot of changes. He uh, encouraged the dropout movement regarding standardized testing. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he, told the, he gave the teachers more autonomy in the classroom to respond to the children's needs more <laughs> than, you know, a little bit like old fashioned teachers who exactly. could do what they wanted in the, in the classroom. Close the door. He, he increased recess. And in addition to that, and this is what I want to mention, he introduced, and this was kind of actually my suggestion, introduced something that they call play club. So play club is one hour that they started off small, just one hour a week before school, I wanted it to be either during the school day or after school, but they, for, for bureaucratic reasons, they could only do it before school. Um, so one hour a week before school, the entire, <laughs> almost the entire school is open up for free play, really truly free play, all ages combined. So it would be mm -hmm. in a typical elementary school, 150 to 200 kids all playing together in the gymnasium, the art room, the art supplies are available, the outside playground, the hallways, they're running in the hallways, they're tossing balls around, they're throwing balls down from balconies. It looks absolutely wild. You would never see this in another school. Now the principals and the teachers initially were worried about this. They thought, oh my God, this is gonna be chaos. Things are gonna be broken. Kids are gonna get hurt. They're gonna bully one another. After a few weeks of this, Everybody was behind it. The teachers even who resisted it, the parents who were worried about it, the people who were worried that the kids, I was worried the kids weren't gonna get up an hour early to go to school even for play. Oh, they all wanna get up to play. They tell their mom, you know, tomorrow's play club, be sure and get me to school. And one of the reasons that it, so, and also the, the thing, there are two reasons I think that, that it really works. One is the teachers have been told not to intervene. They've been told, while you're observing this, you are not teachers. <laughs> you are like lifeguards on the beach. You're there to save somebody's life, but you're not there to solve little quarrels. You're not there if somebody skins their knee. You're not there, you're not there because somebody looks a little lost or they've got tears. This is for them to solve. This is, is for this them written to up solve. Anywhere, Peter? What's Can that? We, is this written anywhere? Can we access this? There are. You can find uh, the uh, uh, ABC New, uh, News Hour did, uh, or uh, public te public television uh, has done a documentary on it, which I think you can find online. And you can um, you have a name for you us. You can I'm find, find this. So, or or go to the uh, website of Let Grow, and you can find information about it there too. So this is this is now going on to more and more schools. There are schools. There's a school nearby me, an elementary school, which has picked it up, and they also are raving about it. The, the teachers are developing a better attitude about the kids because the same kid who looks kind of dull in the classroom looks brilliant out there playing. Mm -hmm. People were afraid that the older kids would bully the younger kids. And I said, don't worry about that. All the data suggests the opposite. Kids don't bully younger kids in this kind of a context. They care for younger kids. They mm -hmm. nurture younger kids. They'll help solve the problems of the younger kids. So mm -hmm. age mixing, you know, another awful thing we've done in our society is segregate children by age. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, most play is age mixed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And age mixed play is more nurturing, more caring, less competitive, less bullying, 
than when children are playing in the same age because everybody's different. And older kids naturally like little kids. They naturally want to help little kids and little kids love older kids. So yeah. when they're playing together, you know, whether they're roughhousing together or when the older kids are giving them piggyback rides or whatever it is, or they're playing ball and the older kids are showing them how to throw the ball straight. Everybody's having fun in that kind of play. So part of the secret, this, this to me is a way to make real play possible in our culture today, because where else can kids get together in such large groups and age mixed groups? In the past, you could just go out to the vacant lot and there'd be other kids of right. all ages right. and you play, but now you can't do that. So we need these kinds of situations for, for you know, the, other, the other promising development is the development of adventure playgrounds. And that's another thing we're supporting. And growing, there, there's a somewhat of a revival of the development of adventure playgrounds. So these are playgrounds where they're, they're also called junk playgrounds. There's, yeah. uh, you know, old tires, there's boards, there's hammers and nails, there's trees, there's stuff. And they're fenced off. And the reason for the fencing is to keep the adults out. So <laughs> I, 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 I can see I, 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 dying to say something. Jesse, what, what, yeah, what do you I, think, I think there? That, yeah. this adds an interesting question because hearing Jenna's question in our work, what we'd say is you want to create the conditions for adults to see the capacity of children, to discover what children are capable of. It'll change their relationship with children. And that means seeing and hearing children in play. And so if that change comes in part from adults seeing children then you have to think about that fence between the children and the adults if you want to change the systems. Because if you're not in an institutional setting, if you're not with adults that are making decisions about those children, seeing what children can do, then they're not going to fundamentally change their needs vis-a-vis uh, -vis the children. Um, and so for us, I Ms. Chung's experience in China, certainly when she told Chinese parents that their children shouldn't be learning, that she, they should be playing, how she said it was, I listened to what those parents' needs were. They wanted their children to be safe, they wanted them to be clean, they wanted them to be sanitary, and they wanted them to learn. And the parents' desire for the child to learn is a good, natural thing. Here's how they're learning. I'm gonna show you, you're gonna experience your child learning. You know, it's not a message a lot of people get. Uh, we were working with a child in, in California with, um, you know, on, on the spectrum who was blind um, and six years old, and we spent an hour watching her engage with materials behaviors that she had been told by, you know, a, a, a trained um, professional were signs of distress. We saw her using those to mark when she had made a hypothesis and seen the outcome. And so in a week she was riding on roller skates and she was blind because she had an environment where adults saw what she was capable of rather than using their limiting assumptions to design courses of behavior that they expected that child to see or that gave them the satisfaction of their anxieties being answered through the certainty of a prescription. For us here, actually, at, at, at our school, um, we have had to be incredibly um, clear about what kids are learning as they play, because they would go home from school every day, and the parents would say, what did you do today? And they, they would say, we played. And the parents would be, you know, oh, no. You know, I'm not doing all I can for my child. Yeah, and right. so we created some called the daily buzz and at the end of the day we create a document that parents can read so that they can understand all of the incredible things that are happening for their children in play um, without us having to say to the children now remember to go up when you go home today and you tell your parents about how you divided all of these you know no toys between yourselves and the other kids. Remember to tell your family that you were doing division today. You were actually working on the algorithm. For, you know, I mean, we we don't have to say it to them, but we say it to the families. And I think this this is one way that that we can sort of change the hearts and minds of the parents because I think that that is the only way that we're going to move this move move public schools and move other schools away from this idea that play is not. Um, beneficial for children in a way that's quantifiable. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes, by the way. My notes are really exciting. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'll take a copy of those. Yeah. I, I just want to, uh, I tend to do this when I'm listening and, and, and absorbing everything. And what I'm hearing a lot about is that we're in a position as people who really love play. We have a position here of advocacy. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing is that what, I hope that by the end of our time together, which is in nine minutes, uh, excuse me, 
uh, just so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of the timing. I just was wondering if we could all collect uh, some of our thoughts at the end of our time here together to discuss what we want to do long term, because each of us obviously has, has had great successes with our interpretation and our expression of play in the various uh, organizations that we've been involved with. And, and, and including our lives as parents. But what I'd like to see, because I'm, I'm looking at all these notes that we've made, that I'd like to see how we can advocate. Because this last piece was fascinating that I come from an evidence-based world. My, my career as a physician all became about evidence-based. So that basically we ended up you know, economically dictating the terms of how we practice medicine because it was really important to make sure that whatever we did had a clear change in, a, in the behavior or the health of a human and that it was economically a, a very, you know, um, a credible model. And, uh, and you can see where that's put us now in the pandemic. But evidence base is what's happened actually with learning and education, that people have, you know, generationally been forcing all of us to look at. So what works in school? And what are, what, are, what are the results we're looking for? And so we've moved away from advocating for the constituent creativity that's so important in education. So I'm, a, I'm asking us to have a task here. I'd like Julie to read yeah. this, okay? And there's a dichotomy that we make in our society between play on the one hand and learning on the other. Right. We've got to help parents understand, just as Julie does in her classroom, that play involves learning. A lot of the emphasis that's going on in the schools on drill and kill is generated by our government's attempt to engage in the standardized testing model and to propel all children forward. So, you know, no child left behind is the origin of a lot of this stuff. And that was done by Bush and Ted Kennedy. I mean, the, the intention there was Lovely. The intention yeah. was All good. right. No child left behind. Let's own it. There's been this huge achievement gap, but the irony is that all they created was what I call a learning illusion. The learning illusion is that if you memorize junk, you're going to be a capable person and a capable student. And the research, there is a ton of research, Jane. We need more on what kinds of things play can promote. And that's why we make a distinction between free play, which is what we've pretty much been talking about the whole time, and guided play, where parents or teachers more likely set up the environment for children and follow children's lead in bringing out the things that children ask about, the things that children are interested in. So for example, we did a study, Kelly Fisher was the first author, in which we showed that teaching children about geometric forms, you could do it didactically. You could say, you know, a triangle has three corners and three sides. So one of the conditions was didactic. One of the conditions was free play, just giving them things that they could play with to discover these properties. And another was guided play, where the person working with the child followed the child's lead and got the child involved in a make-believe way to learn these properties. Let, let's learn the secrets of the shapes, right? And it was in that latter condition that children showed a 30% increase over children in didactic instruction for being to able to recognize novel instances of geometric shapes. What does that mean? It means learning that takes place in a playful way where children have agency is generative and it's sticky. That's what you want, sticky learning. And just telling kids stuff and asking them to memorize things backfires. It, it doesn't stick in the same way. And we have a lot of research now that shows this. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I would just say, and, and then I see Peter has something, but I would just say um, at our school, the, the kids wanted to build a, a lean-to. They wanted to build a, a fort. And over time, you know, with, after a lot of experimentation, uh, the discovery was that the triangle is the strongest 
is the, is the, is the strongest shape. Nice. And, and you could spend a lot of time telling kids that, but the fact that they, they discovered that in, in building something that they wanted to have uh, was, was much, much deeper, much, much more meaningful to them. Yeah. Peter, go ahead. I saw you. Yeah. So, so Jane asked about um, research uh, evidence uh, regarding free play. And, um, and so I, I just wanted to mention a couple of research projects that I'm involved in now. One of them uh, is uh, along with Lenore Skenazy, we're doing a huge um, poll right now, a huge survey of families at home uh, now that the kids are home, uh, in which both the parents and the kids are reporting uh, on a regular basis over time on uh, what's going on at home. And already we're getting, and, and in addition to that, we're also, uh, we have this essay contest where kids are writing essays about what they're doing at home. And we're hearing from really many, many families about how the parents are seeing what their children are learning as their ch because the children are free to do what the children want to do and they it's pr now that they see the children in front of them <laughs> they see and we're getting messages all the time saying oh i hope they never start online learning here because my child is learning so much by being freed from these school requirements. My child has picked up the guitar and is learning the guitar. My child is reading books we're finding around the house and asking questions about it and doing his own online research about things that he or she has discovered. My younger child learned to ride a bicycle, never learned to ride a bicycle, been out riding a bicycle. We're getting, I'm, I'm getting, I also got, by the way, uh, an email from a psychotherapist who worked with children who said, I'm seeing a lot less anxiety in my clients now than I was seeing before. And I'm hearing that from parents too. So, the, uh, so in fact, I don't want to say I agree that this is a terrible thing with this pandemic and many families are suffering and many children are suffering. Yes. But I'm hearing from many families and, and in this study, we're going to be hearing from hundreds of families and it'll be interesting how it plays itself out. But we're hearing, I'm also observing it directly. I, I'm a bicyclist, you know, until this pandemic, there would be no way to know that children even live in this town that I live in, <laughs> unless you see them getting on the school bus in the morning and off in, in the afternoon. You never see children outdoors. Despite the, the conditions that you're kind of supposed to be careful outdoors, I'm seeing children outdoors for the first time. I'm seeing, I'm seeing kids riding bicycles. I'm seeing kids playing in their own front yard. I'm seeing whole families play games like badminton. When was the last time anybody saw a family playing badminton out in their front lawn? This is, this is really uh, an eye-opening experience yes, for a lot is. of kids. So we're documenting that as best we can. The other study I'm doing, although it has yet to be fully approved because it has to go through the state legislature system in New Hampshire, but the Chancellor of Education in New Hampshire is interested in research and has asked me to design it. He's concerned about the high levels of anxiety of children in New Hampshire schools, just as high levels of anxiety everywhere. And he knows about the Let Girl projects and so on. And we're doing what I've proposed is a set of formal studies really in an experimental like way where some of the schools will get the play club and some of the other things we're doing through Let Grow and others not. Uh, those, so the, and then we'll follow up. We'll follow up with all kinds of uh, ways of assessing how anxious are the children, how much do the children like school, how are they doing in school how they how, uh, have some kind of an assessment of internal locus of control. I mean, one of the big problems as a result of, 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 uh, of, uh, of play deprivation is that children are growing up feeling no sense of control over their own lives. Right. And that um, predisposes them for anxiety and depression. And it's one of the reasons college students are having such problems. Suddenly they're in college and they don't know how to deal with the independence because we haven't allowed them to. So we're looking at various, we'll be looking at various kinds of measures of those things in those kids who have these play opportunities built into their school day versus children who are doing the same things that they're doing already in schools. Mm. Great. So, you know, it, it is actually 12 o'clock, but if you're all available and willing to stay for a few more minutes, I, I would like to hear from all of the panelists a little bit uh, just um, about this idea of how, how, we can, um, how we can document and help um, 
families um, and all the stakeholders uh, to sort of understand this this critical benefit of play and why it's not um, why it's not extra why why it's so important for us. So uh, I, I with other people created something called the Learning Sciences Exchange, and what that's about, funded by the Occam's Foundation, is breaking down the silos between researchers like myself, between journalists, between people in the world of entertainment and people in the world of educational policy. The idea is to help all of us understand ways to help the public understand that it's not play and learning, but that they're one and the same thing. And if we could think about additional ways to influence parents' thinking and understanding, I've always wanted to make PSAs, public service announcements. They have to be fun. They can't be teachy-preachy. To show, like you have a little voice come down and say, oh, he just learned so-and-so, and look at that, he learned this. Because I really want parents to understand how playful learning fuels children's lives. And another thing that we have, and it's currently in the world, Playful Learning Landscapes. It's available online to have a look at. Playful Learning Landscapes are installations that are being requested from us for all over the world, including in South Africa. We have a supermarket that has signage that encourage, encourages parents and children to talk playfully. And we have things of this nature that invite parents and children to play and talk because speaking to Jane, there is gobs of research showing that when parents interact with their children around their children's interests, children learn. So we have targeted these two um, low income communities where parents may, we're not sure, play less with their children and what we're trying to encourage, these are things that are actually outside in the real world. We have installations in Philadelphia, for example, and there will be something in Seattle and other places. And it's all about getting families out there talking with their children and playing. It's not prescriptive in the least. It's what families make of these things. And we point out very minimal signage because you don't need signage to know what to do that these are the kinds of things, for example, a hopscotch that has no rules, but we encourage jump as it says, and then jump another way, builds executive function or children's ability to self-regulate. It's really important for parents to understand that childish games are important for children's development and learning. You know, red light, green light, you play this stuff, Jane, when you were a kid, mother, may I? You had to control yourself. Simon Says, there are scientific papers on Simon Says. Children have to control themselves if they're gonna win in these games and they're motivated to engage in the self-control that they need to become more adult-like in their demeanor and behavior. Interesting, Roberta, interesting. I, I'm wondering now from, from, from Jesse and Jana, if I could just hear a little bit about um, how these threads kind of move across borders. Well, uh, and what you've seen in, 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 other, in other places around play. Well, I would say, I just want to kind of um, come in on this question of research and evidence basis. Um, you know, I, my wife's a pediatric neurologist. I, I believe in science. And, um, but I also know that research can be marshaled in any direction. Questions can be asked in different ways. The outcomes are defined in the design. Questioning and testing hypotheses, there's truth in that, but you can marshal evidence in a lot of different directions. I think that what we communicate to people around the world is the best research evidence is the child in front of you. And for a lot of teachers, a lot of children, and a lot of parents, we really have to ask them to stop listening and reading a lot of people from outside their own experience, explaining to them what children can do, what they should do, how they should be. And that sounds a little contradictory because I'm now saying this is what you should do. Don't listen to other people. What I'm really saying is you should listen and see the children in front of you. And that is something that is important, I think, in our work, regardless of, of where you are. Um, but it affects national policy and local policy, how you justify outcomes, how you measure. The danger is those measurements justifying decision-making that 
systems of capital, of power, the needs of the marketplace, whether it's 21st century skills, which are defined by an economic forum representing business interests predicting their needs in 20 years, they sound nice. Let's go argue for complex problem solving, but don't design systems based on what those systems need in their extractive way from children and families. Um, go back to the child. Um, discover the child if you can. I think for right now we're working with, with our programs, we want schools to be listening to the needs of families. Where are, where's the family? Where are they? What, what are their rights to food, shelter? If there is trauma, if there are uh, you know, unsafe circumstances, deal with that. But then when you can deal with those basic needs, listen, create opportunities for children to have unmediated contact with each other. We have technology that allows that. You can have 10 children on a Zoom call. Um, and as a teacher, you can create spaces where you're listening to what a child's experience is. Um, one of the recent examples, I guess for me, from being in Anji in a classroom um, with fives and sixes, we were watching a teacher doing what's called play sharing. She had been out in the morning for an hour and a half, taking videos of children in her class, engaged with water and with other materials that were in the environment. And we were in the back, we were videotaping her because she's been there for three or four years. She's an, a beginning teacher in her, in her growth. And she was really interested in the fact that the kids were talking about an incline in, in the uh, plane that water was going down. And you could see that her mind was going towards, I'm interested in that. She wasn't saying anything because in Anji, teachers don't guide children's insights. But you could see her thinking was focusing on that. What we heard the children talking about was the relationship between pouring water on an object in the pipe in contact with sand the effect of changing the pressure of the water and the incline and the relationship between the sand, the object, and its movement. Far more complex than an inclined plane. And if the teacher thinks that the inclined plane is important, then they're missing the complex physics that those children are defining for themselves. So for us, it doesn't matter where you're on the world. See children, listen to children, be present, be patient, um, if you create an environment where your focus is what you're doing is important, I want to hear it, then you can be present for their play and not make it about your emotional needs or the needs of systems that you don't control that want to extract something from you. Beautiful. Jana, can you talk a little bit about your experience? And uh... Yeah, so I, we're in South Africa where we are, I mentioned we're in the townships and our parents are not reading the literature, <laughs> all of the evidence coming out. They're not reading any of that. They are not aware of it. Um, they, they see what they know and, and that's, that's what they have access to. Julie, you and I have talked about the daily buzz and um, how in the environment that I'm in, the children come home from school and they say they played and their caregivers, most of them are not biological parents, so we call them caregivers. Their caregivers and families say, okay, but what have you been doing? And they're, they have low literacy, so they're not, re we don't have a daily buzz we can send home. So the only way that we can really shift that thinking is, Jesse, following up on your point, is the child in front of them. And making sure that they are watching that transformation and allowing that child to be and experience what they are in our school and that is a safe space. That's a safe, in our community, even right now with everything going on and there's a lockdown in South Africa, there's been a ton of crime in the community where we work in. And Ubuntu, where we are, a, the community center and our campus has, has been the safe space for people to come. And right now, our children and women and families are even more vulnerable than they were before. They, don't, they can't do Zoom calls with 10 kids on them. They can't do anything like that. We're lucky enough that we're topping up data for our teachers to call them and some of them can't answer their phones because they don't have phones or they don't have enough data to even pick up the phone. So we're dealing with really challenging issues and right now our goal is to make sure we're just checking in with, with caregivers and families and that children are okay. And uh, I guess the, I'm sorry, I've, I've not gone off <laughs> on a tangent, but it's context matters, right? Oh yeah. Context matters, and that's what's important. And play, to me, the common thread is the reality is regardless of resources, culture, where you are, it, it's, it is universal. Like, Roberta, you started off this conversation. Yes. It, it doesn't matter where you are, children are going to play. And we're finding out how children are 
playing in the environments that they're in. Roberta, you mentioned in the home, they're in their homes or they walk outside and they're, they're playing as they can with their neighbors, but not getting close to them in, in terms of what they can do. And you can see just from the stories that are coming from our teachers. And that, that is what I am inspired by right now every day is just talking to our teachers that are all from our community there in South Africa and the stories that they're getting, but that children are, are stuck at home. And so it's, it's what they do and how they're experiencing the situation that they're in and how then their parents are allow caregivers are allowing them to interact with the situations that they're in, allowing them to play like we've kind of gone back to is keep the adults out. Um, and just, it's so layered because then I think of this other hat that I wear as a mom of two kids in a public school in Brooklyn. And when we talk about policy and, and everything that we need to do to you know, shift the, the conversation or shift the policy. It's, it's complicated because the same highly educated people I know with their master's degrees and their PhDs can sit and talk about play and the importance of play. And I let my children do this and all of that. But then when it comes to, you know, standardized testing yes. for our third graders or the report cards coming out, they completely pivot. Mm -hmm. And they're not the same person that I was, you know, talking to over a coffee before school or after school. That it, it completely shifts. So I think it's really complicated when I think of the situation in South Africa, the situation in Brooklyn, and then how yeah. I'm mentioning yeah. two places that, you know, represent a very small population. So I'm going to have to go pretty soon, but this is such a hot group. I am so enjoying this conversation. I just want to say we can bring back joyful learning. There is no reason to engage in this kind of drill and kill stuff in the schools that is not good for children. And it doesn't even promote the best kind of learning. So I think that under the influence of the testing movement, which has not been reduced even with the Common Core, curriculum, we're still marching in this direction where we're looking for kids to do better on standardized tests. And the irony is they're not. They're not. The achievement gap has been stable for about 35 years. And children are not improving in states. In general, we don't need to just keep fixing at the edges. We need a radical rethink of the way that schools should be run. And it is much more like when we were kids than now, because there was not this emphasis on pushing kids to read in kindergarten when they're not ready, taking away all the manipulatives in kindergarten that they need to understand number. That's the irony. We're doing things that shortcut children's real learning. Well, um, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think there's so much more to be said here. And, and maybe, this is, maybe this is a panel that could reconvene at some point. Yes. Uh, yes. So um, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful to everyone, um, to all of, our, all of our panelists. I, 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 I am continually amazed by your insights and your, your thoughtfulness about this subject and so many subjects that I think we touched in this conversation. Um, I, I learned so much today and I, I appreciate that. And I, selfishly, that is, that is what I'm after. That's how I feel. <laughs> so um, I wanna thank you again. And I just wanna say when we, when we close our meetings at Slate School, um, we, we always say positive rice and we send it out to the world. So I'd like to say positive rice to all of you, to our panelists, and to six continents while I have a chance. I don't know if I'll have a chance to do that again. So thank you to all of you, and um, we look forward to seeing you all at Slate School again, and I hope that we can reconvene this group um, at, at, a, at a somewhat later date.